Yes. Right, okay. Um, can you take this lid off? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you all know Susan? This is Susan. Hi, Susan Kowalczyk. Hi, some of you are familiar faces, some of you are not. Uh -huh. Hi. I'm gonna and say, she's in charge of, uh, of uh, she's the registrar? I'm the curator, curator. of the and collections and I'm yeah. in charge of research here. And research. So she's the person who basically goes out there and finds things and brings things up and then say, and she gets to pick some, some things. Um, yeah, and Susan and I put on a lot of shows together. Yes, we have. All right, can you take this one yes, up? I, I want to see how it's, how it's made. Because it's like, uh, um, it's, it's sometimes good to look at the inside. This thing here probably could have been a really beautiful bowl. Um, I would say the ears would have been put on later on, hands would have been put on later on, the bottle would have been put on later on. But he would have done a really great mold job. The tooth would have been put on later on. Yeah. This guy, Mark Burns, is um, probably one of the best restorers in the business. Did you know that? No, I did not. Yeah, and he basically has fixed all kinds of pieces down in Philadelphia. He was like kind of a restorer. Um, what I, what I like about, I like the way that this thing's here made, is figuring that has a really nice area to kind of like fit that thing in there. For slip casting, that's sort of good, but, but, you know, like you give, you know, he might have poured it through the bottom for, for this, and then this thing here could have been a core. So I, I would have thought about that. Don't care for the lid. The lid basically, uh, I wish that the lid had some sort of like, put the lid back on. I wish the lid wasn't just uh, a, I wish that it had something that's almost like a nail. If that was a nail, it would have been good. Baby. Yeah, that's like little baby's crying anyhow. Mm -hmm. uh, huh? Yeah. But if, like if this was a nail or if it was like something where it's trying to look at, but just being this little flat slab, that's sort of a, like from a Korean pot, where the like little uh, Yi Dynasty pot, which was a little bit flat jar, which just had a little uh, cookie on it. So that cookie thing there, if Susan put it next to here, put the lid next to it. If you take if you take the lid here and you look at that lid there and say which one has more sculpture, this one has more sculpture. So how do you take that lid and kind of take it to the potency of sculpture that this one has? Right, you put it back on. Does anybody else want to look inside? Go we'll look inside. I can just leave it off. Thank leave you. it off. I've got a t-shirt. OK, so um, this one here is like, uh, this one just, this isn't a jar, is it? This is just a sculpture. Yes. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about this one. Um, all right. This one here is an early Peter Bocas, and it has uh, uh, just really kind of, um, you know, you set the bray at this time. The bottom parts of these things here would have been really smoke, uh, smooth. We have a beautiful bowl of his. A little bowl of his that we bought, Margaret and I bought at Sofa. And what I love about the bottom of it is like the bottom of his pots were like really kind of fine. He's going out and finding local slips and slurries and then um, just putting on um, a little bit of wax resist and kind of graffito through it um, or put the slip on and just kind of. The glaze underneath is probably a Malloy um, mat. Clays, and then the colors of it would be local clays that we had around uh, Helena, Montana. Um, trying to figure out what the drawing is, there's a wonderful piece in the Waylon Gregory uh, book over there, which has uh, some sort of the figure drawings that are on these pots here. <coughs> Waylon Gregory and Bocas knew each other because they probably would have met at 
one of the Syracuse National shows. And Tom and I were talking about it over, over um, the, the weekend. When we get to the Wayland Gregory thing, you see a lot of stuff happening with sculpture. And when you get to Vocus, the pot basically became something else. The hominid of the pot, all that kind of stuff. You kind of like pull something together. So, um, this is just, you just get to see your drawing. This is a piece I want you guys all to look at. This one is, uh, was done probably about 1979. And it was done in drag. Um, by Kurt Weiser. It's Raku. It's a nice Raku piece. Um, and it's it's probably just uh, we're, we're going to take the lid off so you can see inside of it. Um, it was probably thrown to about to here. And then there was probably some sort of uh, it probably, then probably had a dish that was put on top of it. I, when I'm feeling inside here, I feel maybe a seam to it. Other ones that he did during this period of time, he would sit down and throw these really wonderful big forms that were about this big. And then what he'd do is leave it there, stiffen it up a little bit, and then would recenter it so that there was a little bit more mud in there so that he could do this, this uh, cut. When he did this thing here, when we, when we did it, uh, we, this was cut with a knife on a bevel. Now, we, um, the problem with that is things like that uh, want to warp. So, what did he do to get rid of the warping? Did it when it was super dry? He did it when it was leather hard. How did he get rid of the warping? It was, he picked it up and then he put it back down with brave wax resist and he glued the thing together with wax resist. So you had this really beautiful, absolute tight wax resist line in here that was, was nicely cleaned up and then, then he could just like fire it but the wax resist would burn out on the greenware, so things wouldn't warp. Okay? So, huh? Did what? you know that? No, I did not. Interesting. Now, if you were Wayne Hinkby and you were making the, the um, landscape jars, he would have sandbagged them all down. And maybe Kurt Weiser might have sandbagged this down a little bit too, just so things get warped. Like a little sandbag? A little bit of sandbag, just like you take a little piece of sand and you just uh, put it in a plastic bag and put it on there. The Kurt Weiser uh, was a really, he was the director of Gray. Would this, this down, um, this was probably a Higby Raku body and then he just kind of uh, double ripped it nice and tight. He was in school the year before me at Kansas City. Oh. Okay. It has a little chip on it, see? Yeah. And then these were all just low fire glazes that um, were from Duncan. And they just kind of like use these low fire glazes and then rack food it. Right? So, um, these are, this is, you know, this is kind of funny because it's almost where Gluten's was. Gluten's was where the, uh, the addition to the gin was. <coughs> These are a, a local pottery. This company uh, had a barn full of pots and a company called Pottery Barn basically bought the barn full of pots and started Pottery Barn. So, But you, a lot of the stuff that you see right here is almost going to be like what you see in the Whaley Gregory show. Kind of I would say that these pieces here would be really nice for the joint shapes. The, um, they're, they're just how the parts and pieces go together, um, trying to figure something out with forms. And there's a nice piece that's going to be in the back that's an uh, Andreas piece where he just figures out what the parts and pieces are. And you know, what's nice about these things is you, know, you know, take the body part of it, that's a nice pot, 
take the side part of it, that's another nice pot, and then you you kind of like put something that I would I think that some of those would be really nice um, things to uh, sort of to exploit for things. And if this was open, which is not, this piece here might be really nice made upside down. Okay. And there's an artist who does pieces upside down. That's Bob Brady. I don't really need to talk to this one here. Alright, so yeah, this one here would be really nice maybe made upside down, where you kind of like have this whole thing supporting it, but that's the headdress. And then later on, you kind of, you know, but Bob Brady did these great big wonderful heads with these little teeny bodies underneath them. Do you have one of those? Yeah. Yeah, but it's a, it's a nice way of working, just trying to figure out where it goes. Okay. Are, are these in the show because they incite some of the larger sculptural work? I would say these are in the show because the volume that is going to happen in the Wailing Bravery happens in the pre-Columbia pre pieces. I would say these are in the show because Wailing Gregory is an Art Deco uh, uh, sculptor and Art Deco was into what the history uh, was being uh, uncovered. So um, during, during this period of time, King Tut's tomb would have been uncovered. Well, when that happened, everyone went crazy for Egyptian things. So you had all that language there. And you know, we're also, we're also a culture that doesn't have cultures. You know, we, we, we live in a culture where we, not until about, uh, in 1776, it was against the law to make pottery in the United States. It was against the law. All the pottery in the United States was owned by the British government. You had to buy everything through Britain. And so, when you have like, when you have like, uh, 1800, and you're trying to like figure out what America's uh, qualities are, the quant what we want to do with pottery. We had nothing. We were just like we're picking and choosing things. So it's like, so we're looking at pre-Columbian pieces. We're looking at uh, American, you know, the American Indian pieces, Mexican pieces. Like if you're Kenny Price, it's like he's looking at the Mexican pieces. Um, there's all that stuff that's being put together. So I've been looking at these things here. They're, they're great examples of, you know, you could go to prehistoric uh, uh, pots in, in you know, uh, Hungary or something like that. You can get Venus de Willendorf or something like that. It's that, that stuff there. But these are great pottery shapes. And you look at these things as what the form is. And you start to say, oh my goodness, What's that? What's that really great little leg thing there? It's like maybe I want to just take part of that thing. So, but uh, I take the head off. And it's like this little one here. A great jar. Put the head on. Great lid. You just you put it all together and see what you come up with. Okay. Now um, this piece here we just got, and um, this one is Stephen the Stabler, and it's a. And he was, uh, he's into just what he could do with mud. So, uh, and he was into the figure. So he's part of the California school and he's just trying to ask what something is. A student of uh, vocuses, so that you see parts and pieces, but it's a different sort of uh, lyrical quality to it than vocus has. He's really trying to like come in here and say, like, see what the, the painting is, seeing how something might rip or something uh, kind of move. When Doug Jack was this, uh, teaching here, Doug Jack said, I want to bring Stephen to Stabler for, for summer school. So he brought Stephen to Stabler for summer school and he stayed for a whole year. It was like really kind of great. So it's like Stephen was here and it was really kind of great to see how he would interact with it. But just you're, you, you have this really great archaeology, you have like things about death, you have the you know, wonderful almost like ghost qualities that you see in a Melchard piece. There's lots of different things going on. Just 
the softness of the thing is not a thrown softness that you see in a Vocus thing. It's just seeing how the clay kind of like works in a really kind of quick and uh, fast way. So it's like when we're talking about today in your studio, it's like, yes, I, I just have this eagerness to kind of like make something work, and that's, that's going to uh, be really great. Um, when Mark and I went down to New York City, we, um, we met this really great person named Fong Chow, who did a lot of work for Glidden, and he was a really great uh, uh, thrower and glazer, and uh, really great, did wonderful things with glazing. He was from Hong Kong, and he was in school here probably in about 1958. Uh, am I about right? 50s, yeah. In the 50s. He worked uh, with Glidden, but after that he went to work for the Museum of uh, uh, the, the, the Met in New York City, and he was in charge of the Asian collection. So um, what I like about the, the pots that he gave us, he gave us a few really great pots. He gave us a Shang Dynasty pot with a handle that's down low. He gave us a, uh, some shards. <coughs> Rosangin piece? He gave us a great Rosangin piece. A little tray that's about this big that is like a little river that has some uh, red maple leaves on it. It's super. I love that piece. It's a really great piece. Um, but he, and a really great Han Dynasty piece. Didn't he give us a Han Dynasty piece? I don't know. I think so. But. Uh, it was, so what I like about this is, this, this is a really great stand. So if I'm like dealing with my mold making part of this thing here, oh, I want to deal with my mold making. This thing here is a really great mold making stand here. It's like a little press mold. So it's like, can these lids come off? Yes. Okay, can you take um, this one off? Yes. Okay, and we're going to we're going to can flip it over and show them the inside. Okay, now let me see what can. Oh, oh. it's up to the figure. Okay, so this thing here. So imagine, imagine if I have a little blank, and I have these little four mold things here, and all of a sudden I'm just going to like press into that thing there. Pop that thing off, and then I got this thing here. Recenter with another little piece of clay. A stamp there, which is a mold thing. A stamp there, which is a mold thing. Uh, if I want to like have two stamps on the side, here I go, bing, bing. I got that. I got my eye. All that's all that's a mold thing. So it's like these people. The clay is garbage. I can't stand the clay. But it's like, when you work with this mucky muck, it's like all of a sudden, the press mold really does something really great to it. Okay? So, uh, and, uh, nice. Whoa! And this is like, this stops at about right there, so you have just layers and layers and layers. Now, you guys know why these are so tall? I assume they held the ashes. Yeah. They held ashes, but ashes go down to powder, don't they? And they sort of... Yeah, but they held ashes. But the ash, the, the problem is, is they had to put a femur in there. They didn't crush the ashes down to the powders. They, they basically were very carefully packing bones in here as tightly as they could. And there's... They, you know, they basically, they, they basically take after the cremation, they were like, said, here's this, and they figure out how to pack all that stuff in there. Huh? It's, well, it's, well it, 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 you'd have the whole body in there. And then they fire it? No, they wouldn't fire it. They would be, they would, this would be fire glazed, everything, and then they would, they would use it as a storage jar. Does, does the imagery on these pots sort of say something about life and death? Because I see the serpent here. Yeah. Oftentimes represents this traveling. Yeah, and you have like your sages 
you, you, you probably read something like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it might tell you where you're going. Uh, you have these wonderful clouds that are like moving around on it. But all these things are just little samples of like, the one thing that's really great about China is um, Mark Carney, who was the first museum director here, um, she said what's great about China is they deal with um, food and death. And so they, they really are, they just nail that. And food is like just the biggest part of the world. So, so just, just pay attention to what you got. This, this might be, just, I want to see what I can do with that mud. And just kind of like work it out. Yeah. There's a the seam that's about here. So then just like kind of like adding another piece to it. All right, now the other piece I really think is a great piece going into the way with Gregory show is this little piece here by Elsie Binns. Elsie Binns was uh, Charles Curtis Binns' daughter. And the, the glaze that's on this thing is sort of a um, high calcium glaze. They call them, um, what do you call those? Bristol glazes. It's called the Bristol glaze. And it would be an architectural glaze. One of the things that's really great about this is there's a, a person who is the um, same time as Rodin. And it, his name would be um, uh, Modardio Rosso. If you've taken um, uh, Mary McGinnis's class, you might have come across Modardio Rosso. Modardio Rosso was a person who was working in plaster. And then what he would do is cover the piece with um, different colored waxes, just really, so he had a wonderful sense of transparency. And so this one here, uh, what's really nice about the, the glaze on here is how the glaze is, is really absorbing the light in kind of a really rich way. Okay, one, let me go back over here really quickly. This, here, this piece here is um, um, in, in, um, a Shire piece. Ed, Ed, Edward. Edward Shire. And then, the sad thing, what I found out about it, was like, what connection does he have to Waylon Gregory? He worked, he worked in a factory with Val Wieseltier in, in um, New Jersey. And Val Wieseltier and Edwin Shire and Rose Cabot's husband worked together. And Rose, he, the Cabot brought back clay for Rose Cabot. And this person here became this elastic pot. And it's one of the things that's really kind of, and I was like trying to like figure out where did this thing here come from? It's like these really kind of great stamping things. So it's like, this is almost like Wiener Werkstatt. And so Val Wieselt here, Wiener Werkstatt, Susie Singer, all these people were very influential on, on Waylon Gregory. And they were from, they're sort of like the Vienna secessionists. So did anyone see the movie, the, uh, the, the Woman with the Golden, I think where it's the Clint movie with the painting? It's a great, it's a family that owned this painting and they, uh, uh, they wanted it back and they were like trying to get it out of the museum. They win the court case, they get it back, and this painting now is in, at the Estee Lauder Museum that's in New York City. It's like, it's, uh, they keep, like uh, it's a woman with a golden brooch or something like that. It's like, Clint did like, uh, like a kiss or something like that. A lot of like pattern decoration. So this thing here is like trying to figure out what they can do with decoration. It's, uh, and the clay stuff is, was sort of, Valley Wieselt here figured out how we can deal with mud in kind of a really wonderful, awkward way. And so like, let's see what it is. Hoffman and a lot of other people are like saying, I need to see how tight you can get something. Valley Wieselt here, mud, let's put glaze on it, let's kind of like work with it and get it really tight. So 
That's good. Perfect. Now let's go here. And so you have, um, there's no copper on this um, at, at cone 10. But if we, okay, so this one here would be a really great example of something being fired down. And so you have, uh, underneath this glaze here, you have the cobalt. And then you come back at a lower temperature with your china paints. This one's will be that that one's a probably an iron lead china paint. This one here might have a little bit of uh, copper in it to kind of like give it the green, maybe a little. So if I took this up to cone ten and refire it, the green's gone, the red's gone, all this stuff is gone, and gold's gone. Everything's gone. All that gold, all that. So what you do is like you start to take this thing apart and say, how do you reconstruct this thing to kind of like make it? So you're going to do one of these. That's on your civil list. All right? All right, you're going to like do a fire down piece where it has more than one, you know, try to, okay? This is a great piece. Where'd you get this one? Who made it? It's from Sweden. So it's silver. Huh? Silver on on the blades. It's tarnished. It's almost like electro. It's like electroplated. Probably. Huh? Probably yes. This is cool. It's so cool. But it's like it. That's something that they could almost like grow on. It. Okay, this one here is done the same way as this, where you have like things in layers. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Let's go over. This is a nice conjoined piece. You just kind of like put it all together. And okay, let's go over here. This is where we're going to be coming here and play with the uh, about the show. Um, I haven't had much time. You haven't had, what do you think about it? Um, it's a very unique style. Um, yeah. What do you think about it? I like the variety of that. Right. What do you think about it? Um, I, I don't know if I care for the expression of this one. Of uh, the figure. The, the boldness. The bulb is in it. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I... But it's a style that basically might not be the style that you want to play with right now. Yeah. Okay. What do you think about it? Uh, I like how it's like kind of weaving architectural elements into like a... It's like it's kind of planning how you do the ceramics yeah. for like a building or something. Uh -huh. What do you think about it? I like it. I mean, I'm still kind of taking all this in, but... But you don't know about it. Yeah. No, it's not so... What do you think about it? I think I like the wide variety of the work that shows. I think it's really interesting. Okay. Uh, what... Laura, what do you think about it? Um... 
think I like all the figures and the colors. What do you think? Okay, what about those things there would you take and put in your work? Like the cleanliness, like the intentional. I mean, I don't know the intentionality things, but there's something that like draws me into these, I just want to get close to them. There's something that brings back their quality. Okay, you know where those things would work really good on? Food ornaments. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Or television sets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These were the, you used to have this really beautiful box that you come to every Sunday, go over to Grandpa's, and there's a beautiful chest here, and then that thing there was sitting on the chest as a piece of sculpture. You open up the, the thing, and then all of a sudden you look at that thing there. But one of the things about that is like, I like what you said about cleanliness. Because there might be something about the cleanliness of this that you could take in there and kind of really examine. So is there any people that you think of as artists that use cleanliness in their work? I can think of two really quickly. Uh. I mean, my first thought was like Peter Pitchers, like someone like that. That'd be good, yeah. yeah. And Courier, uh, Ron Nagel, mm -hmm. and Kenny Price. So it's like, what would, what would somebody like Kenny Price do with, with or, or Ron Nagel would do with this thing here? I mean, Ron Nagel might be like, totally, or, or you could do Mark Burns. Mark Burns would take this thing here and say, oh, let me figure out what that thing is. How do, it, it had this strange allegory, that, that wave. He was like, how do I, what do I want to do with that wave? So maybe what I want to do is just like this one here. You want to see a really great rhyme angle? This shape right there, that's a really great rhyme angle. Ron angle could take that shape there and all of a sudden simplify it, put it together, and make a sense out of it. Or you have this really great stretchiness of this bird down here. Look at this. Don't go to the bird. Just go like how that thing might be stretching out of there. It might be a, a place where. And then, you know, or I think this great piece here with that, where that thing's like trying to move that dancing thing there. So you know, it might not have to go to that, but you take aspects of this and see what you can come up with, okay? Which, when I first came to uh, seeing the way the regular thing was when I was at Kent and uh, in Ohio. And in Cleveland they had pieces of his at the Cleveland Museum. I didn't know how I felt about them. But the more I look at this stuff here, I start seeing some pretty amazing things. The cantilever on the swimmer is really awesome. Where the, that thing is just like trying to move out. This thing here is almost is almost perfect to like what would be an audio. Audio. How you doing? You can see again. Uh, the audio pieces would have been a really simple cylinder, and then all of a sudden, with the audio pieces used to look, look like this. Little teeny arms out here like this. And I tell Rudy, I said, Rudy, you don't have enough paper to draw the arms. And so it's like, you know. So Rudy, you put another piece of paper there. All of a sudden, now the arms kind of like move out there. So you're really trying to get this, this cantilever out here. You know, you're not just kind of like saying, this bout only goes out this far, okay? And then I think the, there was a wonderful piece that was, uh, the, the, the other thing I like about this is how the mountain sort of climbs with, you, you try to figure out what the landscape does with the background of these things, where on Madonna over there, where you have all that like kind of like crystalline structure like popping out, that's really kind of amazing. Or the fire over there, 
if I was going to make the fire, if we had to, if we had to redo the the Whaley Gregory piece, the fire piece, can I get her to be on the board? <coughs> Is, this, is there something that could be a little bit more elastic about it? Then, over here we have something that would be, you have uh, Thomas Hartman, we have all the, the social realists who are trying to figure out what the WPA things are. You know, you just have, you know, like here, like, here might be oil wells, here might be farmers who are trying to, these are great little pieces. This little, they're, they're probably almost, uh, they're probably salt, solid. Just like big packs of play, just like fire back really kind of great. But I like the way that they kind of just like kind of move together. All right? Oh, do you know how this piece was made? In the book, oh, let's, uh, let's, where's the book? In the book, there's a picture of this one here. And it's all honeycomb structure. Um, I'll cook it. Yes, the whole thing was put together with a honeycomb structure. So what he did is he had this really great kind of jungle gym structure on the inside, and he was able to work with it all at the same time. And then what happened is he would just let it dry some, and then he would fill it in just a little bit at a time, okay, just a little pieces at a time. Um, this piece here, the when. John Pierre was a student here. I showed him the book that I had. Did you find it? Yes. Uh, I showed him the, so this one just shows, this is the piece, this is the piece made, to see the honeycomb structure? You, you're just, you're just sort of trying to figure out what the thing, um, and that, that's like, that's just, this is the size of it, just nice. So you're just kind of like moving it around. Just, you know, just, just kind of just able to build the whole thing at the same time. It has a little model of it. A little model of it. And the other thing that was strange is in this book there was like something about uh, a, he was in a um, plaster studio that was, that had all these like historical models. There was almost a model of this, but it didn't have the same sort of like eagerness. <coughs> okay, so that's pretty good. All right, there you go. Nice. Here's Susan. Thank you. I'm not going to pick that up. Huh? I'm not going to pick that up. How much does it weigh? Uh, five people. Five people. So that's about it. So um, I would, I would look at Wayland Gregory as. As a blazer, um, I look at him as a sculptor. I would see him in a certain period of time, which would be the WPA time. I would see him uh, with a tremendous amount of influence from Europe coming through. You know, trying to figure out that I'd be looking at people like Archipenko for that dancer over there. Archipenko would be somebody who'd be a kind of amazing person. Um, I'd be looking at people like Greg Husey with some of the, with the simplicity of the head, you know, you, all that stuff moving together. Um, there was a sculptor who was a Cranbrook at the same time as uh, um, when Gregory named um, Carl Millis, who basically did great big sculptors. They were arch enemies. And the, the way that the you're, you're, here you bring in, Cranbrook was sort of like, hmm, let's see. They, they wanted to make sure that they had a noticeable sculpture in it, so they basically bring in Millis, because he comes from the, he comes from Europe. And the Whaley Gregory is, is this really great clay artist who's trying to figure out what America is, and he's, he's running the, the clay studio. And so like, you know, Millis just gets to make whatever he wants to, and Waylon Gregory is trying to figure out what it is to read Jimbalism, all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot to look at here, and I would come over here and just really kind of enjoy it. Oh, one other thing over here. This is really cool.
back in here. And this one here is figurative, but when this is a really great slip cast piece that was fired in this lava blaze, and then they spread it down and they they cut everything off on it. So like, look what you do with like these really great sleeve and, and so but uh, this uh, Suzanne had her show up in Fawcett Nelson Gallery and um, part of the show plugged in and had these little chill elements on it. You didn't get one of those, did you, Susan? No, that's the only one we got of hers. Just that. Yeah, but this is so great because you don't think of it as figurative. Right. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, and then the other one that was really kind of amazing is this, the summer that Andre took here, all of these things were like parts that just kind of threw and put together. That's pretty kind of amazing. And then this person's great. She's over in Elmira. And just, uh, just you, know, you can see this, this whole thing came from the middle. Out. This kind of work. It's beautiful. It's calling it. So that's about it. Susan, we did it. Yay. Thanks a lot. Now, do you guys know about how to get